Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to today's session as part of the 34 presentations on Moodle MOOC 4 in the month of June. My name is Nellie Deutsch, and I'm going to be walking you through uh, some of the uh, introductions, and then we'll have our speaker who is here. So uh, there's our speaker for today. A little bit about uh, Janet. Okay, there she is in the center. Janet and I met, uh, I think, about five years ago. Time really, really uh, does fly. Um, here it is. There's uh, the slide about Janet. She has a PhD and um, is everything about learning. Very passionate and caring and helpful. So uh, she's graduate, uh, online graduate faculty at Capella University, if you're not familiar with it, School of Business, and she's been there since 1999. And uh, she's also a writer and researcher. And what's great about her is that she is exceptionally uh, innovative in what she does. Uh, this is uh, when I came across uh, Janet, well, online interviews, because that's how I did my doctoral dissertation. And in the second book, I had a chapter, which was really exciting. I was really uh, overwhelmed uh, having to uh, be able to join Janet in her second book. And today she's going to be talking about her third book. She's a writer and consultant through her uh, business, which is Vision to Lead. And um, a lot more you'll find out about qualitative online interviews and everything else that Janet has to tell us. So Janet, um, I'm going to pass on the uh, mic to you uh, since you didn't come in as a co-presenter. So uh, luckily we don't have a thousand people here or I would not be able to uh, do it. So while I'm doing that, I want you to take a look at uh, the guidelines for reflecting and sharing. At the end of the session, you'll have a chance to uh, reflect and qualify for a certificate. If you reflect on 10, there we are, Janet, I'll get that to you. If you reflect on 10 of the 34 presentations, you'll be able to, uh, there we are. Okay, so let's get to your, uh, there we are. Okay, so um, you've got the floor. Just let me know, Janet, if um, you're able to speak. You're here with okay. us. That's awesome. Yes, I can hear you. I can't see you, but, okay. but that's okay. Okay. I, okay. I, it says that it's broadcasting my video, but I don't know why. Maybe it's, it's just not, me. So. Maybe it's me. Uh, have you tried the, uh, the settings to make sure that it's the right um, video settings? Uh, in this class, not outside the class, but in the class, there's a device setting just above my head on the top right. right. Yeah, if you could make sure that it's... Uh, it, it, it is working. It says it's working, but it's not, so we'll just carry on. Okay, and, uh, all right. So go as ahead. Long as, you can hear me, as long as you can hear me, we're okay. Right. All right. So uh, thank you, Janet. Thank you for joining us today. And everyone, if you can add the chat box where you're from and uh, use the chat box to chat away. All righty. So I am looking forward to uh, taking your questions and hearing your ideas. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give a kind of the first part of the presentation and uh, have a little bit of discussion and then I'll go through an example and we'll have some more discussions. So what I wanted to do here, knowing uh, the interests of people in this session uh, as focused on e-learning and teaching and learning, to look at ways that online interviews can be used not only for research but also for teaching. So that's what we're going to focus on here today. Um, I'll describe a little bit about what I mean by e-interview projects and why you might use them, and then some of the steps involved with designing e-interview projects, and then some uh, instructional issues that you might want to consider. So what do I mean by 
e-interview research projects. I'm describing that as a set of related individual or collaborative learning activities that include designing, planning, and conducting online interviews, and then reflecting on the findings. So depending on the nature of the class, whether you are trying to prepare future researchers in a research methods class, or using these kinds of exercises in another kind of curricular class that you know perhaps you know really doesn't focus on research at all, um, the findings might be derived either through going through a formal data analysis process to give them the practice of doing that, which um, you know it's you know kind of a, a whole learning in itself, as we know from going through our own uh, studies. Um, or, you know, they could just use a more informal summarization of the responses to the interview questions in order to come up with some findings they can use. And then to, importantly, reflect on what they've learned, not only from the experience of the interview, but also from what they found, you know, from okay. the people okay. they spoke with. Can so, you... Why might we include okay. this kind of a okay. series of... Okay, I, it says that it's broadcasting my video, yeah. but I don't know why well, it's not. So. You know, one uh, reason might be to bring real-world expertise into the classroom. Um, another might be, even if we're working with um, high school students or undergraduates, to you know, give them right. some of the foundation to think about well, you know, research skills. It, 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 it is working. It yeah. says it's working, but it's give not, them. so we'll just carry on and uh, literacy. Um, as long as you can hear me, as long as you can hear me, we're okay. Interactions we might have to conduct right. an interview okay. a little bit different from the kinds of communications they might have, you know, with their friends in a, in a social Kind of All righty. So I am looking forward to uh, taking your questions and hearing your ideas. What I'm going to do is uh, kind of give a kind of the first part of the presentation and uh, have a little bit of discussion and then uh, go through an example and we'll have some more discussions. So what I wanted to do here, knowing uh, the interests of people in this session, uh, as focused on e-learning and teaching and learning to look at ways that online interviews can be used not only for research but also for teaching. So that's what we're going to focus on here today. Um, I'll describe a little bit about what I mean by e-interview projects and why you might use them and then some of the steps involved with designing e-interview projects and then some uh, instructional issues that you might want to consider. So what do I mean by e-interview research projects? I'm describing that as a set of related individual or collaborative learning activities that include designing, planning, and conducting online interviews, and then reflecting on the findings. So depending on the nature of the class, whether you are trying to prepare future researchers in a research methods class, or using these kinds of exercises in another kind of curricular class that, you know, perhaps, you know, really doesn't focus on research at all, um, the findings might be derived either through going through a formal data analysis process to give them the practice of doing that, which, um, you know, it's, you know, kind of a, a whole learning in itself, as we know from going through our own uh, studies. Um, or, you know, they could just use a more informal summarization of the responses to the interview questions in order to come up with some findings they can use. And then to, importantly, reflect on what they've learned, not only from the experience of the interview, but also from what they found 
you know, from the people they spoke with. So why might we include this kind of a, a series of learning activities in a class? Well, you know, one uh, reason might be to bring real world expertise into the classroom. Um, another might be, even if we're working with um, high school students or undergraduates, to you know give them some of the foundations to think about research skills. And then third, to develop their skills in communications online and digital literacy. Um, because the kinds of very intentional and purposeful interactions we might have to conduct an interview are a little bit different from the kinds of communications they might have, you know, with their friends in a in a social uh, kind of interaction. So let's kind of walk through some of these things. Um, first, you know, how how might students conduct the interviews? So what I would suggest is that pretty much any kind of online communication that that is available to your students and realizing that you know people in different parts of the world may have different levels of bandwidth available may be using mobile devices or phones versus computers um, but you know really anything that allows you to communicate will be possible to use for an interview but you know the the um, the interview will be very different depending on on the choices that are made. So I like to describe communications technologies by their features rather than by brand names because we all know those uh, change frequently. So first I would describe the text-based interaction where the communication is primarily through typed words. but there may be some use of images, emoticons, or exchange of pictures. And these uh, kinds of communications could be done with a phone, a mobile device, or a computer. Or we could do video conferencing and communicate through audio and video. And uh, depending on the, um, the tool, it might also allow for some additional text messaging. Sorry about that. Uh, and those might be through a, um, a desktop application or even, um, like, say, a video conference facility that might uh, exist in an educational institution. And then third, what I'm calling a multi-channel web conferencing space. That's the kind of space we're in right now, where we have a variety of ways we can communicate, audio, video, text, shared applications. Um, and you know we can com connect by computers or by uh, increasingly by mobile devices to these kinds of platforms. And then finally, in a virtual environment. So this might be you know something like Second Life or you know perhaps even a game uh, environment. So you know lots of ways that um, the the um, uh, different technologies can be used. And I'll come back and and uh, pick up your questions. You know, once I've kind of given this this overview. So, you know, then, you know, as we think about, you know, how to use those technologies, you know, we also have a lot of choices about the level of preparation we're going to make and the kinds of preparation we're going to make. So, you know, are we going to have a more structured interview, which might be a good idea for someone who is a novice interviewer, have at least, you know, some uh, preparation in advance um, by articulating the questions and the uh, some sort of the main follow-up questions uh, ahead of time, or uh, to create a, a less structured uh, interview uh, where key themes would be identified and, you know, the kinds of topics the, the student wants to uh, engage with would be identified and perhaps some of the uh, you know keywords and phrases laid out but but not you know all of the specific detailed questions 
I think that, you know, here, so, you know, how might we think about the kinds of technologies, you know, as they relate to these styles, uh, you know, a, a, I suggest that a, an interview technology that is based on written uh, communications, you know, benefits from having, you know, some questions written up in, in advance, just, you know, to allow uh, the student to fairly quickly, you know, kind of post those into the text window and not have to try to, you know, keep someone waiting while they are writing those out, whereas a video conference type of technology might work well with, uh, you know, a more conversational style. So, you know, lots of things uh, to think about in terms of the interview itself. But, you know, in thinking about the um, interview as a learning experience, you know, within this, the cold uh, cycle for active learning, I think that it fits very well and allows us, you know, a number of places where we can intersect you know, with the curricular goals that we have for the class, whether it is, you know, oriented towards research methods or, you know, some other subject. Because, you know, in this abstract conceptualization, we have the preparing and designing and planning stage where, you know, we're thinking a lot about the um, kinds of technology we're going to use and the kinds of questions we want to ask. And then the um, practice session that allows us to do, you know, some of the kinds of steps that you're describing in the chat window about knowing how to listen, knowing how to respond, you know, and be an active listener and be a responsive uh, listener to your uh, to your participant. That's something that is a real art and, you know, it's not something that, that people, you know, would generally, uh, you know, have before conducting research. So then once they have had that, you know, kind of practice stage to actually conduct the research interviews, then to have the very important stage of reflective observation, to analyze, reflect, and apply on the new ideas that they use to deepen their understanding of whatever the topic may be for the class. So let me just, you know, walk through these steps and then uh, I'll take some of your questions and uh, and then, then go through an, a, a more specific example. So in thinking through, okay, how might you as instructors plug in these kinds of exercises into a course? You know, how, how might you fit those into the course? What, you know, what kinds of participants would make sense, you know, in terms of what you are trying to achieve? So, you know, I would suggest that, you know, you can really think on a lot of different levels with this, you can think about what you might be able to achieve by having students interview each other within the class or to interview people, you know, within the local community or, you know, out in the big world, across the globe, in cyberspace. So, um, I think that, you know, here, if we're looking at the um, activities within a class, these kinds of interviews could be used to help people get acquainted and build social presence or to build on and draw from the experiences of the students in the class. So this could be, you know, sort of a, a, a warm-up activity at the beginning of the course to um, you know, build some build some real sense of um, you know who who the people are in the class, or this could be a practice stage to prepare for these other kinds of interviews. So, by interviewing people from the local community, they might be able to explore local issues or build relationships with local partners. And these kinds of interviews could also be used to prepare for other kinds of activities, perhaps field or service learning um, taking place, you know, in the real world, in the local community. Or in cyberspace, they can explore global issues and learn from people who are not available locally. And, you know, I'm using the word expert here to describe 
not only people who are recognized as experts in the field, but also people who just have practical knowledge in the subject you are studying. So before I, I have a, an example, I'm going to just walk through these steps, but I want to kind of uh, go back and look at um, the questions you've posted and see what uh, kinds of uh, things you have pointed out. And so, you know, I think that, you know, you've made some comments about structured versus unstructured. And the, um, you know, what I would say about that is that the, the um, continuum, the reason I've placed these on a quick continuum is that I think, you know, within the same interview, you might have, you know, some structured elements where you know you want to ask uh, some defined questions, but then also allow for some unstructured, you know, kind of more conversational uh, interaction around some themes. But, you know, by thinking about this on this continuum, um, the student or the researcher can think about, you know, kinds of what, what um, you know, how best to organize uh, the interview. You know, it also may be that you might have, if in a case where you were, had multiple interviews with the same person, you might start with some of your, you know, kind of more structured questions to get some foundation about, you know, the person's background and experience and demographics and that sort of thing. And then in subsequent interviews, once you've established some rapport, you know, open it up and, and uh, have some unstructured questions. So, you know, again, I, you see in my work, I use a lot of continua because I prefer to think about things that way versus, um, you know, a, a simply and an either or. And I think that, say, you know, for, for students where we're talking about, um, you know, taking a plan, having a, a planning process that, you know, at least starting with some questions uh, would make them feel, you know, a little bit more confident than just going in without uh, any questions at all uh, to define in advance. Let me see what other. kind of the beauty of the online environment, you can choose and, you know, choose the technology that will be most comfortable for. Okay. So, um, we have the one question about the differences between face-to-face -face interviews apart from the technology side. Well, I think, again, looking at the, the kinds of technologies that we might decide to use, in some of these, you, you know, say, I would say that a video conference style of interview would probably be the most closely comparable to a face-to-face -face interview because you could see the person, you could see... Um, you know, something about the setting they're in, um, they could show you artifacts or items, you know, by, you know, putting them in front of the camera, whereas, you know, with, say, something like a text-based interview, you know, that would be, um, you know, fairly different from, from having conversation and, and may not necessarily happen in a completely synchronous way. It might be that, you know, the person is sending some questions and, and the person responds you know, when they come on online. So, you know, that's why thinking about the technology is important um, before moving forward and deciding what visual elements you would like to include. Let's see, what else do we have in the question here? Um, you know, say, pay for the travel to, to actually bring them uh, into, you know, a face-to-face, -face, you know, or, or kind okay. of, you know, a uh, guest speaker situation. So let's just kind of walk Okay, and seeing can, can also draw you out. So I think, you know, if you're, it, it kind of, you know, depends on what you want to learn from your participant um, and, you know, it's having the, you know, the video conference available allows you to uh, have, you know, learn from the nonverbal signals and other kinds of things. But, you know, as you're thinking about this, I mean, as a researcher 
or you know for you know yourself in terms of your own research the kinds of choices you might make might be different from the choices you would want to make available to your students you know what uh, you know what level of kind of uh, communication skills do they have you know what is their uh, technology access and and comfort you know what kinds of you know so say for example if you uh, were teaching a class online using a tool like WizIQ, IQ then you could be fairly confident that your students would be comfortable in an environment like this and could conduct interviews in an environment like this uh, whereas you know someone who um, is teaching a face-to-face -face class or a blended learning class uh, you know their their students might not have you know access or, or comfort you know in something like that so you know I would say you know there's some you know thought process you know on your part as an instruct as an instructor and you know again as you're saying you know what you know you know what would the comfort level be for uh, the people they're planning to interview you know whether you want to show their face or not and in some ways that's kind of the beauty of the online environment you can choose and you know choose the technology that will be uh, most comfortable for uh, the participants uh, who are involved so I'm going to um, go through kind of walk through an example I put together and one of the things that I would like to suggest to you is you know as you're thinking hopefully about trying out these ideas with your own classes is that depending on the amount of time you have available for the um, this series of activities and the level of the class some of these elements you might want to kind of organize you know more firmly in advance uh, for your students and in other cases you might want them to really take the initiative and explore all the options and try things out and decide for themselves so you know the, those are, are choices that you'll need to make and again as you're describing about you know who is an expert you know when I'm using the word expert here I'm talking about you know the expert in the knowledge being studied in this class so it could be the practical experience of having lived through that um, you know kind of uh, um, you know whatever the the topic might be or it may be you know someone who is recognized in their field who uh, you can invite into a class given the beauty of the online environment but you know might not be able to you know say pay for the travel to to actually bring them uh, into you know a face-to-face -face, you know or, or kind of a you know a live um, guest speaker situation so let's just kind of walk through you know a little example here and and see you know what you think about this and hopefully you know maybe you'll generate some examples that we could play with you know from your own teaching so let's say for this example um, that you know whatever the field might be um, you're studying um, the techniques a leader might use to work with a virtual team so you know this could be in an NGO it could be in uh, sociology it could be in business whatever kind of uh, you know field of study education you know we work with virtual teams almost almost everywhere so I'm just going to throw this out as just an example to play with so we what we want our students to learn is about ways that people um, keep virtual team members motivated so if that's my place that I'm starting then I'm going to go through these four active learning stages of preparing designing and planning practicing conducting analyzing and re reflecting coming up with follow-up questions coming up with probing questions so in the preparation stage here they could read assigned materials and or find resources in the library about teams and leaders so here might be you know where they're reading um, the kinds of uh, textbook uh, readings or you know other kinds of materials that you would typically use in the course so they're getting a foundation of knowledge about the topic at hand they're learning the vocabulary they're learning the accepted practices about you know this 
you know, field, whatever it may be within, you know, the curriculum you're working with and, and the level, et cetera. So then the next stage would be to think about the design for an online interview. What kind of technology would they use? And going through some of the thought processes we were discussing a moment ago. Um, you know, what would the participant feel more comfortable with? And what um, kind of information do I want to gather? You know, is it important for me to see the other person? Is it appropriate for me to see the other person? Um, you know, what, you know, what kind of technology is going to fit? That process of, of consideration, I would suggest, is a learning experience in itself. Then to identify the interview style and questions. So going through the kinds of thought process we were discussing a moment ago, you know, to what extent should it be structured, unstructured, or a mix of structured and unstructured? And then importantly, what kinds of questions do I want to ask based on what I've read, based on what I've learned in the class? Uh, what what's unanswered? What do I want to know from someone who has practical experience in actually doing the things I've been reading about? Then to uh, identify some participants. And here, as an instructor, this may be something that you uh, would want to assist with, um, or it could be as simple as um, you know having them you know find someone you know in their own lives. Uh, someone they know, you know, they know that um, uh, a relative, you know, works in an organization that with virtual teams, or they know uh, someone in their community who uh, runs a company and, you know, might be willing to uh, participate in an interview, you know, at, for this assignment. Then, you know, they would um, go through some of the logistical steps involved with planning to um, arrange the time and place for the interview. We get to, you know, what Kolb and active learning enthusiasts would say is, you know, really. So then, in the, the stage, the practice stage, which I think, you know, is an important that active experimentation that Kolb talks about, to actually conduct the interview they've planned with someone in in the class, with a peer in the class. So try it out and practice the kinds of skills that many of you have pointed to, the act of listening, the um, response, the coming up with follow-up questions, coming up with um, probing questions, making sure that uh, they can use the technology they've chosen. And then with that peer, troubleshoot any problems that came up. Discuss it. You know, how, how could... How could the student improve the steps they've taken to develop the rapport? You know, are the questions clear? Are the questions too long and wordy and complicated? Or, you know, do they use some jargon that, you know, the participant doesn't understand? Um, you know, do, do they really pick up on the potential for, for digging deeper with the follow-up? So, you know, this is active experimentation stages is very important to the learning um, opportunity for this type of an act, activity, act, uh, for this kind of a e-interview project. And then, of course, you know, how to manage any technical problems. Do they need a plan B? Do they have, like I did, where I tested my video, but when I got in here, it didn't work. So, you know, to kind of build the confidence to just move on if uh, if something isn't exactly perfect. And so, you know, in terms of um, some of the points that you're making about, um, you know, using, you know, different kinds of media, you know, I, I, I think, you know, going back to the old uh, statement by Marshall McLuhan, the, the medium is, is the message. What medium is going to best fit the kind of subject matter you're trying to explore, what you want to learn, and the people you want to learn it from. Um, oh, Nellie, she's just amazing. 
Um, it says okay, so then after they've gone through that practice stage, then actually conduct the interview. So in this case, since we're talking about um, leadership in virtual teams, the students interview someone about and to ask about how they motivate their team members, how they communicate virtually, etc. So they actually carry out the interview. But uh, we don't stop there. Now, I would suggest, if possible, it would be valuable to record the interview. And, you know, if we're using a technology like the one we're in right now, uh, then you, um, you know, have the ability to record it. And that gives you uh, the potential for sharing that recording um, as a part of the reflection activity. So now, after uh, after you've conducted the interview, now we get to you know what uh, Kolb and active learning enthusiasts would say is you know really uh, the most important part of the process, and that is to analyze, reflect, and then apply new ideas to deepen understanding of the topic. So, you know, here they can compare and contrast what they learned from that participant with what they learned from the readings. So they can see, you know, did, you know, did the, what they learned from the interview confirm what they've been reading? Um, did it uh, elaborate and, and kind of give them new insights to what they've been reading? You know, or did what they learned from the person with the practical experience, you know, absolutely contradict what they've read uh, in the uh, in the texts and, and the assigned readings? They can reflect on the content of the interview, the processes, the responses, you know, whether the technology worked or not, um, you know, you've talked a lot, you know, in the um, in the text chat about, you know, some of the challenges of, of interviewing and of learning how to interview, which is why I think being able to uh, do this as an exercise in a class before you are conducting research for a thesis or a dissertation is a good idea. So, you know, what do, what do we learn from doing that? You know, how could we do it better the next time? Uh, and then apply what they've learned, either to present the results uh, in a present oral presentation um, or to, you know, write them up, you know, in some kind of a written assignment for the class. You know, and those are choices that you could make as an instructor. So um, I'm going to just uh, see whether some comments in here that relate to these points. So lots of practice is required to be good at interviewing others. And you know, I, I think you know, one of the reasons that I'm trying to emphasize the value of, of incorporating these kinds of interviews within the class, even for you know, different kinds of subject matter and different kinds of levels of uh, academic um, work is that you know it it it, it, it does take um, it does take practice um, it does take practice to get confident uh, and to know how to follow up I think that's the the trickiest part to really dig and to know you know where um, you know where there's kind of more that that you want to bring in or or how to say refocus the interview you know if it's going off track uh, Okay. Three elements. Um, so Stephen is pointing out the, the, the need for three elements, interviewer, interviewee, and the audience. But I think that, you know, we're not um, in a research interview, for example, you would not have an audience um, for the actual interview. The audience, quote unquote, would really be, you know, the reader for the findings of the study. I mean, typically, there is not, um, for confidentiality purposes, you would not have an audience. So we're not talking about the kinds of interviews, you know, someone, um, you know, would do on TV, as you mentioned, John Stewart and things like that. You know, say um, social interviews or or um, um, entertainment interviews. We're talking about here about interviews to to gain information and insights, you know, from. 
you know, again, the interviewee. About, so, you know, it's certainly, um, you know, possible in a classroom situation to decide that it would be valuable, especially at the practice stage, to have, um, you know, some, you know, observers for the process so that, you know, in this kind of critique for the interview, um, they could, um, you know, provide additional feedback, you know, to help the, the person um, improve their skills. Something that concerns you or you feel, you know, is an issue, then use text-based interview and write So, in terms of the, you know, issues about language and accents, so, um, this is why, you, know, the, you know, the couple of points that I would make, um, you know, in response to that, you know, if you are, um, uh, well, Stephen, I, I think that in a research interview, you know, again, that the audience would be the reader of the study, um, you know, usually, a, you know, say a confidentiality agreement would, um, would not allow having, um, you know, someone there as, as a casual observer. Um, you know, if you had a research assistant, you know, certainly in a more complex uh, study might be uh, possible, but um, I think in a research setting, it, it's not something I've really encountered. Um, it's kind of usually the opposite that the interview would take place in a private kind of setting. Um, but, you know, in a classroom situation, you could decide that the observer role is something that you want to include and, and structure your activities, you know, in, in a way um, that makes that possible. Um, well, I, I don't know. I, I have not encountered um, interview studies that have had three people, but, you know, we'll agree to disagree on that one. Um, in terms of, you know, the issues with language, um, if both people, you know, would have a written language in common, then, um, you know, it might be best to use a text-based um, interview process, you know, because then that way um, you're not distracted by different accents. You know, certainly, you know, the cultural differences can be a part of the learning process. You know, that might be, you know, one of the learning goals that you have, uh, you know, to, you know, if, if you decide that your interviews are going to be in this global sphere, then you have additional kind of uh, teachable moments to think about, you know, what the particular implications might be uh, for the participants you're studying. Okay. So um, Stella is mentioning about the, you know, untimely digression. So, you know, again, you know, thinking about the level of structure, the focus of the interview, and ways to redirect things if uh, if they're going off track and going into a sensitive area beneficial to bring real world perspectives into the classroom via an interview and you know there's a lot of conversation in the text about accents and uh, written and spoken language well if that's something that that concerns you or you feel you know is an issue then use text-based interview uh, and write the questions and write the responses. That way, um, you're not distracted by accents. So again, th this is why you know the the decision making around this can be um, you know quite uh, fruitful in terms of the di digital literacy development of the students because you know the need to consider all of those uh, implications and make the best decision and provide the rationale for the choice that they've made. Styles of communication and then to, you know, talk with 
with so we feel are, are excellent communicators want to just um, how, what they've, what they've learned move on and, and think about, think about you know, some of the teachable moments that are possible you know, what, what when using learn, these kinds of interviews those, as an activity you know, I think in a class. From so again, being able to bring real world perspectives into the classroom, um, I think is a is a valuable element in in almost any field. Um, you know what what are the um, perspectives of people who are living the kind of uh, subject matter that you're studying? What are the perspectives of people who have practical knowledge of putting those concepts into you know into application in, in the real world? And for the students, you know, they're able to then explore the implications and the complications involved with you know really um, you know using the concepts they're studying. They can compare and contrast the scholarly or academic side and the practitioners and uh, lived experience side. Um, on a topic from the experience that people might have you know living through that point in time are there other teachable moments you can think of that would be beneficial for bridging theory and practice in classes that you teach So um, Anna points out when students um, should establish a team for a common project. So you know I think the peer interviews uh, also can be you know very helpful. You know just for okay we seem to have gone way off on the track of whether there should be three people in an interview. Um, and uh, I think that uh, my question for you was what kinds of teachable moments can you think of in terms of the classes that you teach? Uh, where it would be beneficial to bring real-world perspectives into the classroom via an interview. About the experiences they've lived through, um, you know, whatever it may be, the practical knowledge, um, you know, whether or not anyone else recommend, recognizes them as an expert, they, um, they are an expert in, in the experiences they have had. At the same time, um, there are people who you know, are recognized, and we, you know, have the ability to bring them in because they can connect uh, online and be guest speaker in a way. Okay, so um, teaching communication skills, I think that's a that's a great um, example. If you know, we're looking at uh, communication theory, we're looking at say, you know, stages of of communication, elements of dialogue. Uh, productive styles of um, communication, and then to you know talk with uh, with people who we feel are are excellent communicators, and find out you know how what they've what they've learned, um, how they think about you know the kind of important dialogues they enter into, and and uh, you know what, what the student might learn from those. Um, you know, I think the the lessons from history is an excellent um, example because those, um, you know, the, the the cultural experiences and the family and personal stories, you know, often, you know, really missed. You know, when we're looking at the kind of, you know, big historical markers, of, you know, that that are represented in a textbook. And how you might, uh, you know, make the best choice. Um, so, you know, in terms of, um, find that when let's see, I'm talking with people who are thinking at a very preliminary stage about the research, the forms of reasoning. Well, I'm going to do these interviews on Skype. Well, I'm I'm referring to textbooks here. I I think you know whatever whatever it is they're reading, um, they're reading articles, they're reading you know. Like materials they found online, you know, whatever they're reading to gain the subject matter in the class um, would still be different from the experience 
that people might have, you know, living through that point in time or that, uh, you know, that particular kinds of uh, of setting. In general, um, are there others that you would add to this list? What are other, you know, kinds of goals that you might have for your students about digital literacy? So um, Anna points out when students um, should establish a team for a common project. So, you know, I think the peer interviews uh, also can be, you know, very helpful, you know, just for, you know, learning uh, about each other and, yes. you know, building sort of common uh, goals for, you know, what they want to accomplish in their project. So, you know, I think that that would that would be, a, you know, good um, point of view. And, you know, as I say here, you know, responding to Stephen's point, you know, when I'm using the term expert here I really you know I think that the ordinary people talking about their lives you know they are an expert about the experiences they've lived through um, you know whatever it may be the practical knowledge um, you know whether or not anyone else recommend recognizes them as an expert they um, they are an expert in, in the experiences they have had at the same time, um, there are people who, you know, are recognized and we, you know, have the ability to bring them in because they can connect uh, online and be guest speaker in a way that might not be possible in other, in other settings. Um, in, Veronica, in terms of sensitive topics, uh, my research into online interview research shows that people do find that they are beneficial when talking about sensitive topics, that the kind of distance, you know, being behind the screen, you know, helps people feel safer to discuss, you know, sensitive, you know, kinds of issues. Okay, I'm going to go on to some more teachable moments. So I think that these kinds of interviews as a class project also allow for teachable moments in developing di digital literacy. Um, just in the conversations, you know, we've had here uh, about, you know, why you might choose one communication tool over another. Um, you know, what the uh, language or, or accent or accessibility issues might be with someone, um, with your communications partner and how you might, uh, you know, make the best choice for the technology. I find that when I'm talking with people who are thinking at a very preliminary stage about their research, they'll kind of say, oh, well, I'm going to do these interviews on Skype. And then I'll say, well, why? You know, what can you get from Skype that will be beneficial to your study? You know, they, they, they hem and haul because they didn't think it through. But having those conversations with your class and Asking them to provide a rationale for the choices they're making will, I think, you know, improve their digital literacy in ways that will be beneficial not only for future interviews, but um, for their kind of uh, participation as a digital citizen in general. Um, are there others that you would add to this list? What are other, you know, kinds of goals that you might have for your students about? digital literacy and that you know interviews themselves are certainly a part of you know other kinds of professional uh, activities as well as academic activities so some of the teachable mo teachable moments i would see would be in planning an interview negotiating an agreement with the interview participant um you know, even, you know, coming to the... Yes. What, what digital literacy skills do you hope to uh, develop with your students? Contribute, um, having that kind of discussion. Do you want to expose them to different kinds of technologies, uh, build their skills to use them in uh, different, different ways that they might use for uh, professional purposes later on? Uh, you know, what, what do you, 
you know, want to develop in terms of digital literacy and, and information skills for your students. Yes, I think um, your point there, technology that facilitates interaction and participation is important. I, I think, um, you know, in looking at, the, there's a, a scale that, that I think is interesting called the technographic uh, scale, where it kind of has a whole ladder between the um, passive consumer of information online and the you know contributor and content uh, producer online and i think you know as we're seeing you know more and more people just um you know kind of satisfied to simply access you know what is out there versus being creative being interactive you know knowing how to uh, be a responsible you know party in an online dialogue and those are, are, I think, you know, real digital literacy skills that they can uh, develop. And again, this, you know, when we're talking about teachable moments, this means that, you know, as the instructor, you're calling out these points. You're asking them to think about these points, not only to do them, but to reflect on them, to discuss them, critique, and, you know, and think about ways to, uh, to improve you know, rather than simply doing it and, um, you know, in, in a non-reflective way. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that these are skills that are important um, for surviving in a digital world, you know, and being a an active, contributing digital citizen. You know, I would hope that these kinds of activities would build um, a student's confidence in their ability to communicate with people who are different from themselves and even um, so that they could use those skills you know in in the you know out, out in the rest of their lives so you know as we're thinking ahead you know even if we're teaching students who are not at the um, the stage graduate student stage where they are going to need to think about a thesis or a dissertation I still think that you know ha having those research skills the the, the, the building blocks for those research skills um, is is important and that you know interviews themselves are certainly a part of you know other kinds of professional uh, activities as well as academic activities so some of the teachable mo teachable moments I would see would be in planning an interview negotiating an agreement with the interview participant um, you know, even, you know, coming to the logistical arrangements and, you know, what will be covered and what the person is comfortable with, you know, what they, you know, are willing to contribute. Um, having that kind of discussion is a valuable skill, a valuable competency or experience for the students. I think, you know, pointing to some of the um, some of the comments that were made in the last discussion about being a confident and participatory digital citizen, that being able to create a credible presence, you know, as an interviewer, as a researcher, um, is a valuable experience for students. Um, gaining the confidence to ask someone questions, to follow up, be an active listener, and to present themselves, you know, in in a way that you know someone who may be older than them or different from them, you know, would um, you know would respect um, is is a is a good um, a good experience for students. You know, we've talked before about you know the value of being an active listener, being able to ask questions to different kinds of people, different kinds of questions, and then to follow up and probe. I think that, you know, that's a valuable skill that, you know, will keep people from just being, you know, passive information consumers and, and you know, hopefully uh, give them some uh, ways that they might uh, ask questions to people in the future. I think it's an important research skill to learn how to respect parameters set by participants. And this um, goes back to some of the points that were made um, 
earlier about, you know, I mean, on one hand, you know, keeping people from digressing and going, you know, totally off track from the thing that you want to discuss, but at the same time, you know, to respect the parameters that might be areas that are sensitive uh, for the participants, you know, areas that the participants um, have already said they don't want to cover. Or, um, as you've noted, some of the cultural uh, parameters, you know, if someone doesn't want to use uh, visuals, doesn't want to use pictures, doesn't want to be seen, uh, that's something that student needs to learn how to respect and perhaps make different technology choices because, um, you know, of the parameters that were set by the participants. And then, thank you. you know, even if it's a fairly informal interview, yeah, to, to be able to think about yes what it means to collect to, data uh, from someone, what it means to summarize and analyze um, um, that kind of uh, data, I think is is important. I, I wanted to um, ask you, Janet, and you know, I, I think you know things that you're you're adding in this list than, about uh, this color. being kind, specific, and um, helpful. I mean that, how is this that book not just you know say asking formal interviews. questions and uh, you know kind of asking the question that you've got written down on the paper but well, from, being sensitive uh, yes. to is it any the participant from, uh, and, and, online and interviews uh, you know or, clear and uh, uh, interviews and you know time? making Sorry. this a, an interesting experience both for the researcher and for the participant is um is valuable examples of studies that have been conducted using all of these different technologies that um you know, we're in this uh, diagram here. So um, there are uh, examples of studies that use text-based video conference, web conference. I like your point, Nelly, about the, you know, learning to collaborate and work together um, and to not think of collaboration as cheating. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's a very important um, teachable moment that fits within all three of the areas I've identified here because certainly as researchers we need to be able to collaborate um, and and we need to be able to work with you know within the uh, parameters of you know whatever you know guidelines have been set by our institution etc um, but you know by creating these you know the peer interview practice stage, um, you know, you have the opportunity to, uh, you know, really help people gain some skills in giving each other feedback in a constructive way. So, you know, we come to the end of our um, hour, and uh, I hope that these um, ideas have been um, interesting to you, and uh, if you are uh, interested in learning more about qualitative online interviews and all of the, you know, in-depth uh, ways to to think about them, whether you're using them in an educational context or a research context, um, the uh, qualitative online interviews and the cases in online interviews that. Uh, Ellie contributed to, to uh, are both um, available from Sage Publications you, uh, or for, uh, Amazon or your favorite so bookseller. And, you know, I post a lot writer. of resources These on my website. Really, really, uh, um, so you can uh, take, take a look there. In um, uh, research. What about and, you know, I look forward to hearing um, do you from you about, you know, the ways that you that uh, use these writing. ideas if you decide to uh, adopt projects of this uh, kind. I, I update. I uh, uploaded a list of um, with some additional kind of uh, assignment ideas, and you know, so you know, those might be uh, helpful. So any any other questions as we wind up? In an Oxford handbook of um, mixed methods research uh, that's uh, coming out this year, and that one does include, um, you know, some uh, quantitative aspects. Um, my next I'm working on already for SAGE UK, um, it will be called Doing Qualitative Research Online, and it expands... Um, how, how is it different from the first edition? Is that the question? At, uh, oh, okay. 
observations, okay. Okay. documents, social okay. media, uh, things like that. So, um, okay. Uh, uh, well, ca the cases in online interview research includes uh, examples of studies that have been conducted Excellent. using all of these different technologies that um, you know are in this. Uh, okay, it's not going to be me either. Diagram here, so qualitative. Um, all right, so uh, thank they, you. Like they to are uh, examples of studies that use text-based video um, conference web. Anybody conference and, and virtual there, environment Tom has so you know they their cases by the authors the link is okay. uh, and then critiques um, by their fellow authors um, giving okay, some so, uh, you know kind of insight into ways to there. to think about these kinds of research studies yeah, and ways to critique them so uh, the cases book is just you know as it says it's examples whereas oh gosh, the yes. qualitative online interviews which is okay. The um, updated edition from online interviews in real time, this book goes through in depth. It's the how to um, steps for each stage of the research design process. And it expands, um, it's, it's completely almost 100%, in, almost I would say maybe about 80% rewritten from the first edition. Um, to include not only um, the synchronous interviews, which were the focus of the first book, but also um, asynchronous interviews and observations. Um, it includes um, the entire book is, is organized around the e-interview research framework. Um, and there are a couple of entirely new areas about um, quality research um, contributions to the literature. Um, so you know it's it's kind of more the the how to, whereas the cases would be um, examples. Responses from your participants. So you're listening very very closely, and that you know I think is is helpful for you know, building those, you know, deep understandings of, of what you found. Um, there, you know, there are some, some of the um, uh, tools like um, hyper, um, hyper research includes a transcription tool and Vivo includes, a, you know, a transcription tool, but um, you still have to do the, the dirty work to actually listen to it and, and type it. Um, well, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm very much a qualitative uh, researcher myself. This continues to be on qualitative, um, but I have uh, done some work in mixed methods, and I have a book chapter coming out in an Oxford handbook of um, mixed methods research uh, that's uh, coming out this year, and that one does include, um, you know, some uh, quantitative aspects. Um, my next I'm working on already yeah, for I, SAGE UK, um, it will be called Doing Qualitative Research Online, and it expands um, from just interviews and to yourself, also Jared, looking at that you do a lot um, learning as a result of observations, use of documents, social media, uh, way, YouTube, things like that. So, um, so rather than expanding into quantitative, I'm going um, into greater depth that with that different well. kinds so thank of you everyone. qualitative. I'm closing the session and we'll continue the I'll conversation. I'll let, I'll let somebody else do the uh, quantitative. Thank you for joining us, Janet. And I'm looking forward to uh, more. Bye for now.